Welcome. Thank you for coming. I know it's a busy time of the semester, so we appreciate you making an effort and some pizza uh, and hearing what I sure is going to be a fantastic speaker and a great discussion to follow. Um, for you guys, this is your first time. This is our second now cybersecurity from the C-Suite series. Uh, we kicked the series off in the spring with uh, Brad Wheeler, IUCIO, VP for IT, Kelly Professor, the one holder of the true ring of power by all the titles. <laughs> you did a great job talking about a huge range of issues. A couple of feedback there. Uh, today, though, we're going to be focused on healthcare. Healthcare, cybersecurity, a bit on IoT. Uh, but moving forward, we're going to continue this series. So we'd love to hear your thoughts about particular sectors, hot topics, whether it's blockchain, active defense, you name it. We can bring in people really at the forefront of those uh, of those debates. So we want to have this be a back and forth and useful for everybody. It's a big tip, right? Um, also, it just so happens that we have, if you're interested, some brochures for IU's new Cybersecurity Risk Management Master's Program up here as well. So if any of you guys have questions about that, we can talk about it more afterward too. But we're honored to be co-sponsoring this uh, with the Cybersecurity Program and CACR. Uh, so without further ado, I think uh, Vaughn, uh, Vaughn Welsh, Director of CACR, is going to be introducing our distinguished guest speaker today. And uh, we'll be around though to help facilitate uh, the Q&A and, and afterwards. So Vaughn, thank you again. Thank you, Scott, and uh, thanks for co-hosting. It's always exciting to be back over here in, in Kelly. This is, by the way, the last CACR seminar talk of this semester. We'll reconvene in uh, January, on January 11th, what looks to be a, a really exciting talk. We're gonna have Rob Templeman, Chief Cybersecurity Engineer from Crane, in yeah. to talk. Yeah. So that's on January 11th, so uh, take a look for that and emails coming up. Uh, now, without any ado, let me turn to our, uh, our guest of honor today. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mitch Parker, who's the Executive Director for IU Health uh, in, in Information Security and Compliance. So I know since he's joined there, it's been, what, about two years now? A little bit over a year. A little bit over a year. Uh, he's done at least two years of work, though, in that little bit over a year uh, on redeveloping their, their cyber security program. And Mitch is also a very prolific speaker uh, at a number of different events, uh, HIMS, IEEE, Tech Night. And so he's bachelor's in computer science from Bloomsburg University, an MS in IT leadership from LaSalle, and an MBA from Temple. So with that, I'm looking forward to hearing from Mitch on this and ask you to please uh, join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much, everybody. So purpose of today's presentation is to illustrate what we can do to protect ourselves and stop the illusion of technology and its supporting people and processes are enough to mitigate the current threats. A little bit of background. Before I was in healthcare, and I've been at IU Health a little bit over a year. Before that, I was at Temple Health as their chief information security officer for eight years. And before that, I spent six years as a defense contractor. So I actually come from, come to this from the DOD world and a lot of the practices I use, I learned in DOD. So again, that's why I talk about stopping the illusion that technology is enough because that's what a lot of people are pushing these days. And so the areas we're gonna cover and learn from is first of all, cybersecurity is a business problem. Second part we're going to talk about is what the DOD has been saying and doing all along and why this is different than what industry normally does. We're going to then talk about disruptive technologies enabling competition, as I call it. The two biggest I'm going to talk about are blockchain and cloud, because like it or not, blockchain is everywhere these days, and we really have to get our handle on it and how it's going to disrupt business and how it's going to make sharing part of business. That's the disruption. And technology for technology's sake. So I put Facebook and Uber up there because, again, people have put technology out there and they've done so without fully recognizing social consequences. And it's led to some large scale psyops operations, many of which you've read about in the news lately. And the other thing I'm going to put in there AI may, may not be fully ready. And then we're going to talk about the current situation in the government and how it's already forced sharing and, co -op and competition for cybersecurity. And we're also going to bring up the supply chain. Now more than ever, this really matters. And this is an area people really haven't focused on, unless you're some of the larger companies, and how we need to structure our companies to execute on our mission and protect it from outside threats. So cybersecurity is a business problem. I put some statistics up here for everybody. So WannaCry and Petcha slash not Petcha showed that this year. 
So Maersk, the big international shipping company, has recorded over a $300 million loss because of that ransomware attack. Mm -hmm. Merck has reported $310 million in losses so far. <coughs> Nuance gave advance warning to the stock market that their quarter three and quarter four were going to be significantly lower due to this attack. And of course, we bring up Equifax. Mm -hmm. That company may end up going out of business. The current bet among myself and a number of my peers is that they're gonna go to way of Enron and get broken up for parts. Mm -hmm. And Yahoo, due to their series of breaches that weren't caught, had a $350 million impairment charge due to their breach. Not to mention a complete loss of credibility. I mean, who uses Yahoo Mail anymore? Who wants to use it? Who knows who has your Yahoo Mail information? And the thing we're looking at is we're looking at future write-offs from Verizon due to further revelations as Verizon con continues to absorb that infrastructure. They're gonna find more as if everything wasn't enough already. And so it's a business problem. Both Equifax and Yahoo had management issues, and both of them didn't listen to their security officers and put systems in with no regard to privacy and security. So personal example, I actually know Yahoo's former chief security officer, Justin Somini. He resigned because Marissa Mayer basically handicapped him told him he was going to get no funding for what he needed, even when he presented her with direct evidence of security breaches. He resigned rather than have that be a black mark on his career. And the nickname she gave him and his team, the Paranoids. That's not a good sign of good management. And while yesterday's, yesterday's testimony in front of the Senate was an act of contrition, she did not address the root cause, which is, she didn't fund security, she blew security off, and because of it, a lot of people that trusted Yahoo don't. And she pretty much killed single-handedly killed the brand by not listening to security. And Equifax, when their former CEO testified, what ended up happening? He threw a single employee under the bus. Even though, and I'll be very blunt about this, when we did our initial analysis of this, and I'd like to thank the people at Ren ISAC for some of the great discussions they had because I had to do a 48-hour turnaround of a presentation to our leadership team on what happened with Equifax. I pulled more information from the Ren Isaac mailing list than anywhere else mm -hmm. and literally put up there, this is what happened, this is why it happened. All the evidence pointed to a gigantic systematic failure that if one person could do it, could cause that fail to happen, they would be Superman. Superman couldn't even pull that one off. <clears throat> And every other breach we've discussed, and I will tell you, I talk about breaches with the leadership at IU Health on a regular basis. We talk about the biggest item that always comes up with every major cybersecurity breach is due care. The biggest example we've given was OPM, the Office of Personnel Management, where approximately what, 26 million records, including the records of everyone who's ever held a security clearance in the United States, ended up in the hands of an unknown foreign adversary. Why? because the system was running on something called Oracle Forms, something Oracle hasn't supported for probably about six years now. And when they requested money from Congress, they just said, because the system was old, not because the system was teeming with vulnerabilities and anyone could have broken into that system. And it was well known for a number of years that foreign hackers have been targeting the United States, specifically Oracle Forms, because it's easy to break into it. So do care is the cause of most of the data breaches that we've actually seen. <laughs> So the business problem is, this is right under people's noses. Companies need to continually assess, score, and address their risks. And the perception has been that business and IT are separate and they don't interact much. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, when you do an IT risk assessment, most of them don't roll up to the enterprise risk management program most large companies have. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of someone that recently got their MBA two years ago and did so after working in the business world for a number of years, enterprise risk management is actually now covered in most MBA curriculums, and I suspect that it's covered here at Kelly. I mean, it's here. So cyber risk is not covered that is not covered that much in in that in an ERM class. They talk about all other types of risk, but cyber, it's there, but the people running the programs don't understand how cyber rolls up other than to say data breach. So that's something we really have to work on. And the way I've done it is, I've actually done that in my program is, I went to the ERM people, I said, what's your scoring system? 
I will turn you, I will turn in risk assessments to you to use your scoring system. Because one of our executives, the one in charge of enterprise risk, went to an entire room of IU Health's top executives and came right out and said, if you do not use my scoring system, I'm going to ignore what you say. So we use our scoring system because we want them to understand what we do. So comes back to IT hasn't come out of the computer room that much since the 1970s. Back in the 1970s, computers used to be in separate rooms or separate buildings with climate control, and you pretty much had to be vetted to work in those buildings. I worked with a lot of those people back when I was a defense contractor. And it really hasn't changed that much, even though IT sits in nicer areas. And awareness training focuses on scenarios, not the business itself. And with the latest attacks, there's no denying there's a business impact. It can't be buried as a one-time earnings charge. I always give the example of J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan, a few years ago, talked about, after their major hack, which was caused by somebody having a ser Windows Server 2003 unpatched server up for the purposes of employee morale, welfare, and recreation, and it wasn't patched, they said, oh, we're going to spend all this money on cybersecurity. And the first question I had when a security exec from a major, major antivirus company brought it up was, you shouldn't even be spending that money in the first place. And the second thing I thought is, I just finished accounting. I know what a one-time earnings charge is. And I know it doesn't count against net income. And I know that means, I know that means they're going to spend that money and not have to worry about, not worry about the, uh, affecting their share price. Mm -hmm. So the attack was used as a convenient excuse to fund their cybersecurity budget they should have been funding all along. Mm -hmm. One-time earnings charges only work once. And I think the market's getting a lot smarter, especially the SEC and their 10K forms. And what else contributes to this? IT has been thought of as a cost center and not strategic, not strategic. It's led to a project-based mentality that discourages what we call post-go-live work and risk assessments. So to give you an example, you have somebody do work from IT, do work on a project after go-live, upper manager will go to them, why are you doing that? The project's live, don't work on it, even though you're supposed to continually assess risk. And this mentality, it's led to the further division of IS in the business because it means IS is only brought in when needed for projects and they go away when it goes live. But the expectation of numerous federal, state, and international laws, specifically HIPAA and high tech and healthcare, Sarbanes-Oxley for any publicly traded company, GDPR coming May 25th, 2018, be prepared, mm -hmm. the NIST standards, and in finance, the FFIEC standards, the standard is we have to follow up and continually assess risk as to not only ourselves, but as partners to the people in our, in our core business. And because of that, we're not doing that. There's little communication on day-to-day -day expectations of actually managing these systems and what to do. So again, bringing it back to the days of the computer room, even though those days are over and the computers are in the cloud, the division's still there, you might as well still have that floor of your building dedicated to the mainframe. So what did DOD get right? Why is the Department of Defense better at security than we are? They've been open about it. Let's be clear. They've been very open. 10 years ago, I could have gone on Google and basically said DOD security plans to Google, and Google said, oh, here's IASC.disa.mil. Here's how to secure every Windows workstation at DOD standards out there in the open. You could download everything. You want to <coughs> securely configure a Cisco router or Microsoft Active Directory? They had everything available for any US citizens. Granted, it wasn't for the people in Pyongyang, but you don't want them doing that anyway. And the NSA has actually been incredibly good about publishing security documentation and contributing to Linux. I can't think of a major Linux distribution out there that doesn't use SE Linux these days, and that came from the NSA. And they've been working with their vendors about integrating security into their business via their certification and accreditation frameworks. They were using a number of frameworks for a number of years across the services, but they finally standardized on NIST, which is pretty much the one true standard across the government. And the advantage is that they incorporated everything into their business structure. We're going to get into that. They're not perfect. Certification and accreditation, when I was a defense contractor, took over a year. It was an arduous task, mainly because I'd have to sit there as a contractor educating billion-dollar companies. This is how you get software through a certification process in DOD. This is how you get it so you actually pass it. A general signs off and says, yes, you can use this which was your authority to operate. And they, but however, even though CNA took a long time, they set the expectations for all team members correctly. 
the standards got applied across agencies and services. So if you went and had something that was DLA, you could go to Army, you could go to Air Force, you could go to the Marine Corps and say, this is what we did. They'd review it and say, yes, you pass muster. And the deviations, this is, I think, was another big item. They had to be approved by upper management. Usually, it meant a general. So if you had a network security deviation, it went to a general. So another example I can give of this. When I was at Temple Health, I worked with a surgeon who had just come off a couple tours as lieutenant colonel running military hospitals in Iraq and Afghanistan. He did an honorable job for our country. One of the things he did is he was doing telemedicine projects where they were trying to get telemedicine so that doctors could virtually, and specialists could virtually see patients in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the first words out of my mouth to him were, because it was such a deviation as, Dr. Guy, what general, because you probably had to have a three-star sign off on this one. Mm -hmm. Just because the deviation from standards for doing that was so high and the, and the assumed risk was so high that it, had, it would have taken a three-star to do so. But the other thing DOD did, they assigned people to roles. You had a project under that went through certification and accreditation. It didn't go for certification or accreditation without a list of who was responsible and who was going to be doing the day-to-day -day work. And for that work, there was a standard education plan behind the roles and responsibilities for security officers and everyone else on the project. So it was called DOD Instruction 8570.1, which is why the number of CISSPs over the past 15 years has gone through the roof simply because DOD made it a requirement that if you had a security role on a project, you had to either had to have your CISSP, your Security Plus, or your SANS GIAC. And they were literally, I'm from the Philadelphia area, the, they have a major CISSP training center in Bushkill Falls, Pennsylvania. They were busing 30 people at a time up there for a week for CISSP boot camps because they had to meet DOD I 8570.1 standards. That's how big it was. This is about 2004 they did this. So it was incredible they did that, and it's led to a pretty well-trained workforce. And why was it different? Because there were standards, because there was education, it was easier to communicate the security requirements because everyone was at the same required education level. You wanted to be on this project, you had to be a level two ISO. What, what did you need for a level two ISO? Oh, you need your CISSP, you need these training courses. Literally, it was almost like school. And the standards fit in the common criteria, NIST, and other national and international standards. The two biggest we used in DOD were common criteria and NIST. And the current, and the only industry that really follows a similar model is finance. I would actually venture to say <coughs> healthcare in terms of medical and professional education with nurses, but even then, that's state by state. I'll give you an example. The state of Pennsylvania requires nurses take 30 hours a year continuing education credits. Indiana does not have that requirement. Finance. For, to be a financial auditor, you actually have to go undergo federal training, very similar to DOD, to be certified to be a financial systems auditor for FFIEC. And the big issue, however, is that the only federal agency that was really enforcing this was DOD. And a number of other government agencies, they really didn't do that. This led to having systems to support a DOD, biggest one being OPM, being compromised. So. DOD proves one thing. It proves that you're able to do security well, but if your supporting agencies, your collaborators don't do it well, you're gonna have some serious issues and, it might as, and you might as well have been compromised yourself. So how can you make this better? Number one, collaboration. You expand the work that FFIEC and the Financial Services and the FSISAC have done across multiple industries. And I'll also venture to say DOD as well, although not as regimented. And Expand that work, get other industries doing it. And there's another thing finance has done, I learned in doing some research for my MBA. Finance, most, comp most big financial services companies have a chief risk officer that is direct, a direct report of the CEO, which is a recommendation that the federal government has made. That way, risk always has a seat at the table with the CEO. And because of that, you, you can assess and address risk as part of the business because when it goes up to your CEO, and it, more importantly, it goes to your board, you address it. And the other thing you can do, share information and risk. And you really have to share, you have to collaborate. The days of security being done in isolation, they've been done for years. Most people just don't realize it yet. 
When we talk about collaboration and sharing, the biggest example I'm going to give that's going to enable that is blockchain. And the reason why, it's a distributed, basically, it's a distributed ledger. That's what it is. It's got cryptographic validation and verification of all the entries by all participants in the pool. And it's very useful for ensuring the integrity of transactions and that they're valid and they're not altered. And it solves a very, very useful problem with distributed general ledgers and verification and validation of transactions across organizations. This is a gigantic issue businesses have. How do you ensure the integrity of your general ledger? That is one of the biggest accounting problems out there. Because right now, you pretty much have to assume that the organization hasn't done anything nefarious. This is a way to cryptographically prove that you haven't done anything nefarious and show how. And it's not the transformational system that people think of yet. So I'll give you an example. You have people out there saying blockchain and Bitcoin are going to replace banks. Biggest challenge you have with banks is that the entire banking and finance system in the world is based on a little something called fractional reserve banking, <coughs> which basically means your money exists in two places or more, up to 10 at once. I learned that in economics class in my MBA. So blockchain is based, on, and Bitcoin are based on the assumption that money exists in any one place at one given time. So those little Satoshis you have only exist once. So there's no provision in Bitcoin right now for fractional reserve banking, which means that it's unsuitable for replacing our current financial system and replacing banks. And quite frankly, the people that are on TechCrunch talking about this, they need to take, they need to take economics at their local business school before they go spout off about Bitcoin replacing banks. It's not that, but it is an excellent starting point for the future. However, there are three, three key trends to make it succeed, to make it work. First of all, you gotta make sure you have multiple entities participating in your blockchain pool because no one entity should be controlling more than 50% of your computing power. Bitcoin's had a lot of problems. I think they led to that last fork they had a few months ago because there were miners in China that had 51% control of the pool at any given time. The issue with that is when you control 51% of the computer doing the mining, you can control the entries in the blockchain. And you can make them say whatever you want. And you can corrupt the ledger. That's dangerous. And the other thing is, you have to have good collaboration and good business partners to show that you've got less than 50% of the pool, to show that you can val validate and verify that your entries are valid. You don't want to be in 51% control because that basically means you control it and we're back to square one. You've got a general ledger that you control, but the problem is you're back to the old assumption that you are in full, in full control of it, not anybody else. That is something a lot of people really haven't thought about. And the other thing, system security. The way that blockchain systems have been hacked is through poor security and system implementation. So the example I always give is Mt. Gox, which was one of the first Bitcoin exchanges out there. Big challenge with Mt. Gox was that the guy that put it together thought he could write everything possible in the programming language PHP. One of the things he wrote in the programming language PHP, which originally stands for personal homepage, by the way, which was written so somebody could write web pages back in the late 1990s, he decided to write something called a secure shell server, which is used for secure remote administration of computers in PHP. Now, the way the secure shell protocol works is it's very timing dependent. PHP is not a, what's called a timing dependent language. The C programming language is. So the problem is, is that very basic attacks could have been used to attack Mt. Gox and basically take out this take out his servers because there was no security because the security inherent in the secure shell protocol just wasn't there because of how he implemented secure shell. And why is this important? All systems that participate in blockchain need to be at a reasonable, appropriate level of security or else the entire trust fails. Everyone has to make sure that the other participants have good, full lifecycle vulnerability management and defense in depth, period. You can't just assume Everyone's got it. You got to make sure they do. Because again, you're going to have Mt. Gox again. You're going to have Coinbase again, because someone's going to do something without doing due care. And what's going to happen is you're going to have somebody making a crazy error and $300 million in cryptocurrency goes invalid in an instant, just like happened yesterday with Ethereum. And of course, the other part that really hasn't been addressed, and yes, I've been through the blockchain block format, 
is identity and access management. Because right now, Bitcoin is very good for one thing, sending anonymous transactions to people so they can't be tracked. Now, in the Silk Road case that happened a few years ago, the FBI had to do a lot of forensics work, basically go through the blockchain, identify all the transactions that went to Silk Road, and associate them with people. And they were actually able to do so very successfully. However, it took them <clears throat> years to be able to do that, to be able to build that case against Mr. Ulbrich and put him in jail for three life terms. So that's all well and good if you want to buy rent, if you want to pay off ransomware or buy drugs online. However, if you want to do real financial transactions that will stand up to a big four auditor, you have to verify who made the transactions. And to do that, you need strong identity and access management. You need to have a definable process to show how an identity was provisioned, how it was assigned, how they were assigned digital certificates and encryption keys to make the actual transactions on the blockchain and show good key management processes. Because all of that, and I'll take this back to the American Institute for Certified Public Accountants, their cybersecurity guidance directly references cybersecurity key management. You need to be able to have that. You need to have strong identity management because it's a, that's a basic tenet of any regulated transactional environment. I don't care if it's HIPAA in healthcare, because HIPAA says it, high tech says it, FFIEC says it, American Institute for Certified Public Accountants, they all say it, and DOD, you don't get access to one of their systems without strong identity management, period. So if you don't have it, blockchain is not going to succeed. And the other way we have disruption is with the cloud and open compute projects. There's two completely disruptive technologies that show how cooperation works. There's a large number of great technologies out there. Two biggest I can think of are OpenStack, originally developed by NASA and now championed by companies such as Microsoft, Cisco, and Rackspace, the open compute project where you have companies like Google and Facebook and Microsoft all coming together to share server designs. And the big impact this had, the open compute project, several quarters ago, Hewlett Packard Enterprise reported a major drop in earnings that affected their share price and caused thousands of layoffs. Do you want to know why? Because their largest customer was Microsoft, who started building their own servers using the Open Compute Project and stopped buying truckloads of ProLiant servers for their data centers. That's what happened. That's disruptive. People don't buy servers that much anymore. If they do, they buy them from Dell or, Dell or another company. IBM sold their server business off. Why? Because projects like Open Compute Project got rid of the need to actually have servers. And people now share server designs. The biggest beneficiary is Intel, who now sells directly to Facebook. I think Facebook is actually, Facebook or Google is Intel's single largest customer. And I know Microsoft basically validated ARM on server because they came right out and said, oh yeah, we're testing Azure in our data centers on ARM chips with a version of Windows, which meant that they probably had 50,000 servers running it right now. And there's a number of shared libraries and projects supporting resilient computing. Facebook has done a lot of that work. Uber has done a lot of work because they've published almost everything as open source. So you can go out there and build your own resilient solutions, whereas 15, 20 years ago when I got started with the dot-com 1.0 revolution, you had to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on Sun hardware, F5 load balancers, clustered Microsoft environments. Now I can literally spin up on a couple of Raspberry Pis, something 10 times more powerful and resilient because companies have made this open source. And you can literally put it together in an afternoon by downloading a VM. So what does this mean? Business before was inward focused. It was focused on individual corporate performance. This is no longer the case. Data is now a shared risk. And that's what you should be thinking of with the word blockchain. Companies can now work together to increase the resiliency and provide verifiable transactions across enterprises, which is in everybody's benefit, especially for audit and compliance. And that means you open things up when it comes to security standards and you prevent single points of failure. So security now is becoming more open. Whether we think it is, don't think it is or not, it's open, it's out there, it's happening. And the future of security is collaboration using blockchain, using cloud technologies, strong vulnerability management, and strong identity management. I'll make it very clear. When I first started at IU Health, the first pronouncement I made is, we are going to look cloud first for security. I got to meet somebody very great at IEEE Tech Ignite 
back in March in California, a guy by the name of Danny Lang. Danny Lang is the former director of AI for Uber, the former director of AI for Amazon. And if any of you play any games with Unity 3D, he runs AI for Unity. First comment he made to me about security, he goes, when it comes to security, don't run your own stuff. Amazon does it better. Amazon has a thousand people doing security. They're gonna do it better than you. I took that advice to heart long before I had to have Danny Lang verify and validate that for me. People, the cloud providers do it better. better. Google does it better. Microsoft does it better. Apple does it better. You don't hear about many big data breaches outside of people misconfiguring what's already been provided by the cloud providers. You follow what they tell you to do, you're probably gonna be pretty resilient and secure. And I can tell you with AWS, it's pretty hard to deviate. You've gotta seriously screw up and not follow their best practices to screw up an AWS instance the way that happened with the breaches a few weeks ago. So why is this gonna become part of business? Because coopetition helps solve verification and validation problems that have existed since the dawn of accounting with cryptography. That's just, that's it. You now have a verifiable process behind the general ledger. And the focus on these issues, plus the focus on shared accountability, Equifax brought that to light. You know how many companies trust Equifax with their information? Mm -hmm. They bought a company called The Work Number. The purpose of The Work Number? Because companies didn't want to pay somebody to sit there and take those phone calls whenever somebody applied for a home loan or applied for a mortgage to, to say that they worked there and they made the salary. Equifax made a billion dollar business out of it that they recently acquired. When we presented this to leadership, that was the first question. What about The Work Number? Same question a major pharmaceutical company had. What about the work number? So shared accountability is key. And if your company doesn't have legal contracts already in place to handle this, shame on them. And, you, and because of that, you have to keep systems up to date. You have to continually assess and address for risk. And because now it affects your transactions, it affects your business. It's a core business issue now. And I think the events of the past year if a, if a board of directors now can call security an IT problem, they need, then you need to replace them. So talk about replacing and talk about a big C change. Big change that I've seen over the past couple of years has been that content on the internet. It's gone from curated content. Originally when the internet started, everything was like duck, duck, go. I remember the first time I submitted my website to Yahoo to have it included in the search index and somebody actually did this. This was 22 years ago. So now everything's highly automated and delivered with little human intervention. The problem is it allows memes and messaging to be delivered very, very quickly. And I'll be tell you a big example of that is major newspapers. I go into any major newspaper's website, whether it be the Indianapolis Star, USA Today, even though I call that a newspaper, the Washington Post, Philadelphia Inquirer, New York Times, New York Daily News, or NewJersey.com. Yes, I moved here from New Jersey. And you take a look at any of these websites, you have content there, but most of the webpage is not content provided by the newspapers. It's pretty much scammy content provided by a lot of non-US based companies that show a bunch of scam ads. And I actually clicked through the explanations on two of them, which were Taboola and Outbrain. And they basically said, we run automated systems and it takes someone flagging to see if there's, this, is a, this is a fake ad or a scam before we'll remove it. Which basically gives you about, if you're a good scam artist, you're good at intelligence, about 30 seconds to a minute before and that can literally have a bot doing this, putting up these scam ads, putting up these deceptive ads. And I'm gonna tell you something, even CNN has this. I mean, I literally was reading through a CNN ad a couple of days ago when I was preparing this presentation. And first, first thing I saw there was, as I scrolled through, there's all this stuff about CNN money. Then there's like, Bill Gates doesn't want this to happen. Dentists are furious when you do this. A bunch of scam ads and a bunch of scam content right below a picture of Anderson Cooper. So basically, we're at a point right now where because of the fact that, well, first of all, newspapers and news media are losing a lot of money, thanks to Craigslist and other sites like that, these are money-losing enterprises, they prop themselves up by basically hosting scam ads. And what ends up happening is you have these systems that have been exploited by people either looking to make a quick buck or create divisiveness in PSYOPs operations. 
So in other words, everything we talk about that requires a lot of intelligence, no, it doesn't require a lot of intelligence. I could be sitting in an apartment in Brooklyn right now and pretty much put all this stuff up there. And the fact that it took Facebook several months to determine that 110 million plus people saw these fake news ads shows how big the issue is because we've automated too much without good human intervention and curation and we created our own monster. And what, what has this done? What's the effect? We've rolled back 100 years to the early days of journalism. So give people a little bit of background. The Spanish-American War of 1898 was basically caused by William Randolph Hearst, who apparently made a quotation along the lines of, I'll make the war happen. You get, and I'll give you the news and give you the war. What happened is there was a bunch of fake news stories circulated in 1898 around the imprisonment of somebody in Havana, Cuba. This incensed populations so much and incensed people so much that there was literally a clamoring to go to war, culminating in a staged event called the bombing, the explosion of a ship in Havana Harbor, which led to a full-scale invasion of Cuba, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines by the United States Army. We literally caused a war with fake news 120, over 125 years ago. And it was given a name and when, when historians wrote it. It was called yellow journalism. The Hearst family made billions and billions of dollars off of yellow journalism. And right now, history repeats itself. We're getting a prime lesson in it. And we've attempted to replace, it's because we were attempted to replace human eyes and judgment with automation. It has been taken advantage of to deliver negative messaging. It really has been. This isn't the days of 2008 when Barack Obama used social media to basically win the presidency. Now it's being used to deliver dark and divisive messages. It's being done completely automated. And the out that these companies have to deliver these messages is, if we see something, we get rid of it. It's not an out. It's not an excuse. It means that they're doing a really poor job of due care and judgments. So what has this done? How does this affect the security community? Why do I care? because it's made it very hard for people like me to communicate meaningful messages, because we now have to educate on the legitimacy of our sources. And due to the crosstalk with computer security messages, there's a lot more falsehoods and snake oil being <coughs> promulgated, especially about computer security. Those scammy ads I talk about, there's a good chunk of them that are for scam antivirus and scam anti-malware solutions. What do you think they do? They install malware, and they install malware and viruses. And that alone makes it easy to spread phishing, falsehoods, scam software, even malware. Because if I use one of these channels to deliver a fake malware package or a fake antivirus package, the next thing you know, I can, deli I can deliver malware. I have a bunch of PCs I can control. And I have a whole drone network I can use to do more scams, more negative messaging, and more fake accounts. And the other reason why I care, because these ads include a lot of computer security ads and superstitions. And we have to work against that. So how do you combat it? What do we, do? we send people to what instead of sending people to websites flying, instead of telling people to go to a website, I tell people, I give them breadcrumbs. I tell them in plain English to go to a certain spot on the internet, and this is where to go. Click on this, click on that to do their job. And we don't want to make assumptions that people know what we're talking about. The other reason why I type in certain things, I'll give you an example. A few years ago, when we had the Microsoft Windows tech support issues where people were calling up, the scammers in India figured out really quickly that if they bought ads on Google for Microsoft tech support, they could take advantage of the Google AdWords algorithm. And what they could do, when you Google for Microsoft tech support, the first, role, first answer that would come up would be sponsored ad for a scam shop located somewhere in Bangalore that would be willing to take $250 to install malware in your computer. This really happens. So you can't make any assumptions out there. You can't make assumptions that you can trust anybody, let alone a search engine. The other case I can give is to core my eyes. This was a case where a Russian immigrant in Brooklyn, New York, he sold fake glasses online. And the reason why he was able to sell millions of dollars of fake glasses and basically threaten and harass people, this guy did federal prison time for this, by the way, was because he figured out a hole in Google's algorithm where he basically keyword loaded all his websites for glasses brands then when anyone complained, he threatened them.
So this, again, really happened. So what do we have to do? We have to barnstorm. You have to be out there and constantly talking to your customers with your message. So in other words, that's not enough to send out emails and say, oh, I put something up on the internet. I've done my job for the day. No, you have to be out there shaking hands, talking to everybody, telling them what you're doing. And you keep the messages small, you keep them digestible. I learned that lesson from my MBA program as well. No more than 12 word sentences. <laughs> keep the personal touch. Let people know who you are. And you win with the actions, you win by being accessible, and you win by engaging. Every company out there has an employee engagement program. You need to be part of it because you contribute to positive employee engagement. And you want people to ask you questions. And they're only going to ask you questions if you're personable and being part of the business. That's what does it. If you're somebody that sits there and gives the impression that you're an Uber security guy and you know what you're talking about and you're going to look at people with disdain, they're going to ignore you. They're not going to engage. They're not going to call you. They're not going to, people aren't going to feel comfortable with you if you're an idiot, is what it comes down to. If you're not engaging, if you're not a comfortable voice on the other end that's going to assure people that you're going to do whatever it takes to resolve their issues, they're going to ignore you. And that's been a big problem computer security has. Too many people act that way. And I've actually made it very clear with my company. We will not do business with companies that act like that, period. We have made it very clear to them, you will either act professionally, you will be personable, you will meet our standards for ethics, you will meet our standards for employee engagement, or we will not even consider it. I know there's at least one company, we will not engage the company because the CEO posts messages on LinkedIn that are disdainful of people. Anyone does that, I see that on social media, we, won't, we just won't do business because it's not the right message. I had a talk at 11 o'clock last night with the CIO at IU Health about this. I run a referral-based business for computer security. Half my business, for my security team, comes from customers calling us up and saying they have an issue. If I act any, or my team acts in any way unprofessional, we don't have business. People don't report security issues, and issues like and major malware incidents happen because of that. And the next thing you know, you're back to square one and as a CISO, probably looking for a new job. So speaking of jobs, current government situation, there's a number of pieces of legislation out there with the objective of protecting, protecting our critical infrastructure. However, there's congressional gridlock. Nothing's getting done in Washington. However, President Trump's executive order on cybersecurity, it's very comprehensive. It addresses the key drivers as to why cybersecurity events occur. I read through this executive order when I was preparing this presentation. I thought it was incredibly well written. And if Congress could actually execute on it, it would be incredible. It would be great. However, there's a few factors to keep in mind. First of all, it's the first year of a new administration. Democrat, Republican, doesn't matter because of the sheer number of appointees in senior government executive positions for the first year of an administration, it is chaos. The reason why? Because there's a lot of key appointments to be filled. Again, this is not a political issue. It's the way Washington works. And a lot of the current government executive staff, they're interim positions. I'd say 70 to 80 percent are still interim positions right now. The current government staff, the current senior executive service or GS staff, people that are filling in for these roles, they're doing two or three jobs. They're overwhelmed. And there's a lot of uncertainty over other issues, very specifically the budget. So what's happened? The Information Sharing Advisory Councils and InfraGuard have been effective at getting a lot of information to people, and they've stepped in. However, due to the lack of guidance outside the ISACs and their membership, people have been self-organizing to improve security. Best two examples I'm going to give are Red ISAC and EDUCAUSE. I'm now on the Red ISAC mailing list. When I was in Philadelphia, about 27 different higher education institutions all worked together and collaborated on information security. And literally, the biggest message we saw on the mailing list we had in Philadelphia was, who's going to EDUCAUSE? Because people in that market were all getting together. All the higher eds were talking about how they could collaborate to improve security. And they were doing this without university administration knowing most of the time. In healthcare, you have the National Health ISAC, you have HIMSS, High Trust, and a few other large groups in healthcare. Again, we're self-organizing. We're already doing the work. Finance, you have FS ISAC. But the difference with FS ISAC, financial services, has been that the New York and Massachusetts State Departments of Banking, plus the banks, have pretty much mandated membership 
for, as a condition of doing business. And this is very big because where are most major financial institutions located? They're located in New York City or Boston. So therefore, by default, if you're a large multinational bank, <coughs> you got an office in Manhattan, you're already a member. Also, the other big thing is that a lot, a lot of the large banks underwrite the cost of FSI SAC because it's good business for them. Biggest example I can give is Bank of America, who came right out and told, told me they spend millions a year on FSI SAC. And it helps the entire ecosystem. Because that small community bank, they're not going to have $8 million to plow in like Bank of America does. But everyone benefits because those banks transact with Bank of America. And the medical device vendors. I'll be very clear about this. I've spoken with Merck. I've spoken with, spoken with Eli Lilly. I've spoken with numerous other manufacturers. I can tell you, even though it's not published in the news media, pretty much every med medical major major medical device manufacturer is talking. The reason why is because there are 20 different sets of legislation in the states about medical <laughs> device security. They're all working towards standards, and the security people from these companies all talk. The two biggest examples I can give are Merck and Eli Lilly. They've been talking for a, a while. I know both CISOs of both companies very well, and I can tell you they are not unique. And the other thing, the lack of a comprehensive legislation or end in sight to the current situation, this is, this is what it's come down to. We're doing it ourselves. And those IT and security conferences you hear about, you will see groups of security people all talking at these conferences, sharing information. That's how it's happening right now. And it happens just as much as you know, going to the sessions or networking or, or even seeing the vendors. People are doing it themselves. And there's a lot of activity I alluded to, especially in Eastern Pennsylvania. And a lot of private roundtables financed by the big four, facilitated by the big four, and a number of other consulting firms, they've been sharing info as well. There's a one group, eHealth Initiative in Washington, DC. I would say pretty much every major pharmaceutical company and most of the top 20 health systems in the United States are members of that roundtable. So you go into that room, you will literally sit there and talk to 10 different pharmaceutical companies at the same time, and everyone's talking the same language. It's just that that's not getting out there. We're working on it. And speaking of big challenges, we have supply chain. Everyone now talks about the internet of things and what that really means. What it really means, what we really should care about is now we have to really care about the entire value chain that delivers devices and information is reasonably secure. Instead of worrying about IT, now we gotta worry about everything because everything's a network connection. Everything is an endpoint. Because one weakness can cause a cascading failure. So I'm gonna give an example of that, which is Android and smartphones. Probably a number of you here have Android smartphones. So one thing you should think of, you have an Android smartphone, if it has one device that can't, if it has one component that can't support a newer version of Linux or a newer version of Android because of bad device drivers, Qualcomm, I'm looking at you, the entire device cannot be updated. You just can't do it because Android's not going to support it. And Google's, they've tried to fix this with a number of initiatives, but there's, you're only going to be able to address kernel level device drivers so much. Just, you just can't without seriously breaking newer functionality. And right now, because of this, there's a number of phones that can't, cannot or will not be updated. And we have issues because one little part of supply chain, one little component that doesn't have a new device driver for Android, doesn't have it. So you can't update the phone. So another major issue is sourcing chips and components. What if a component has a hardware or software backdoor? How can components be compromised to break into systems? Both the NSA and other intelligence agencies are really good at doing that right now. And how can weak encryption or a hardware weakness leave you wide open? I'll give you an example, over the past couple of years, a lot of hardware implementation of encryption algorithms, they've been broken. So how do you guard against that? How can you be sure of the trustworthiness of your components? What if you have counterfeit components making your way into your value chain? So the example of that, that happened to Cisco twice. That's been published in the news media. So in both those cases, somebody who got themselves permission to deal with the US government sold the Navy counterfeit Cisco gear from some dubious source in China. 
we don't know what was on those routers, what was on those routers or components they sold. We don't know what kind of back doors there were, but compromised equipment was sold to the Defense Department at least twice. There are some people doing serious prison terms for this right now, but that doesn't, that pales in comparison to the fact that in the value chain that powers our nation's defenses, we had counterfeit gear with back doors. Cisco, of all the companies that happened to, it happened to the one that pretty much is the five letter word for networking. WannaCry and Petra brought, other, brought one other item into light. What happens when you have components of your value chain shut down because of, value, because of cyber attacks? So give you three examples. People had shipments and boxes delayed because of pet ship. Maersk, big international shipping company, FedEx, and UPS all had a ton of machines offline because of ransomware attacks. Merck couldn't produce drugs and medication. And we're seeing this now in Puerto Rico as well because of the power outages caused and the devastation caused by Hurricane Maria. Medtronic has reporting that certain medical devices can't be made because the main production line firm was in Puerto Rico. So you have to think about it. Malware is now just as dangerous as a hurricane. So what happens? Do you have alternate sourcing arrangements in place? What happens if a cyber attack hits a major supplier? And one post I had on social media, what happens of you're a restaurant? Will you have enough breadsticks and pizza? Cisco actually led the way. They actually have a dedicated CISO for their supply chain, Edna Conway, and she works on these scenarios. And I think Edna is the first of many great CISOs that are going to be out there working on the supply chain issue. So how do you structure your companies to combat this? There are five major components of our companies that need to work together. InfoSec, legal, privacy, compliance, and our chief risk officer, human resources, supply chain, and finally, our core business. And we're going to discuss the newer additional roles in augmenting our corporate structure. So information security is responsible for assessing, categorizing, and communicating risk throughout the entire value chain. And they are the team that defines and develops the policies and security requirements and communicates them to the rest of the organization. And they're also responsible for security portions of legal contracts and regulatory compliance. Yes, if you're in healthcare, you have a business associate agreement, it has security requirements, surprise, you own it, no one else. And they're an integral part of the business responsible for interfacing with the entire enterprise. I want you to take a look at that right there. They are no longer part of IT. Even though they may report to CIOs, you're no longer an IT department. And they're responsible for developing security plans in concert with the core business. You gotta put that their core business, not IT, to augment the organization and move them towards a more secure state. Because you have to reduce risk at all points. And they work in concert with regulatory affairs. In healthcare, we have to worry about joint commission, HVAC, and a number of other organizations. And with the business continuity teams, because surprise, business continuity is a security requirement to assess all risks to the environment as a whole. And security risks, they're no longer separate. You have to work on the tabletop exercises, downtime procedures, and business impact analysis to assess and address the <coughs> residual risk. That is now a continual exercise with the business, not IT. Does it, saying you have backups and you can restore them is not enough. It's, it's that time between you're down and you're back that you gotta worry about and you gotta maintain your business. Anyone thinks differently, tell them to call Merck, tell them to call Maersk, tell them to call FedEx, or tell them to call UPS. And you have to work with asset management to catalog your assets and use that to determine your risk. Why? Because if you don't know what it is, how are you gonna protect it? And they're responsible for a data classification policy and the associated plans and procedures around that. They're also responsible for developing an effective communication plan for new emerging and existing threats and maintaining the education plan, including job appropriate training, scenario-based training, including your phishing simulators and training for regulatory compliance. Surprise, you're now a trading department too. And they need to understand the environment and the players better than anybody else. Because you have to continue to assess risk, that's your job. And most importantly, we know two things about companies. There's a work structure that's formal on the books, and there's a real work structure. You need to learn what the real work structure of a company is. To be able to secure it. So that brings us to our friends in legal. They're responsible for developing the requirements in concert with InfoSec for to store and share the minimum possible information for the minimum time possible to, with a minimum amount of parties. 
or as a seven letter abbreviation for that, we call that privacy. And we're also they're also responsible for developing those legal contracts that definitively assign proper levels of liability, assurance, and responsibility. And they are responsible for ultimately making decisions on acceptable risk levels for the organization. Because quite frankly, CEOs aren't going to make that determination. Usually they're going to defer to their lawyers or chief risk officer. And they're responsible for the insurance policies and making sure they are adequate and cover what's needed. I actually sit on our team that evaluates insurance policies every year. Every company out there, because it's now a condition of doing business, has a cyber liability policy. And most important, they develop, negotiate, and implement the contracts, agreements, and standards that they, they need to have rigorous standards for. This includes your data interchange, your establishment of security standards, vulnerability management, which is now a contract item. No matter what company you're in, you don't have vulnerability management in there, you, then you're behind the times. And liability, assurance, responsibility in case of a breach. This is a major sticking point with most companies because a lot of companies don't want to assume that responsibility. Even if they're, even if they're cloud-based and hold your data, they don't want that responsibility. And of course, incident, incident management and cyber insurance requirements. HR, people don't think of them that much, but they're very important because they're supposed to work with InfoSec and legal to make sure we have the appropriate policies and procedures in place for human capital management. This includes your acceptable use policies. And again, you have a case where you have to terminate somebody or discipline somebody, you don't have the policies in place, it's not gonna happen. Which includes your acceptable use policy, your corrective action policy, especially for cyber actions. And there was actually a good amount of discussion on the Red ISAC mailing list earlier this week about people doing Bitcoin mining on university resources. So, that's something which, ironically, when people wrote acceptable use policies about 10 years ago, most universities already had that covered, thank God. Training programs are very important because it has to be logged and trained in a learning management system along with all the other job appropriate training. And surprise, that's required. Also, the employee background checks and recertification for access to electronic medical record systems or certain financial trading systems, that's a requirement. Also, your verification and validation of access rights and collaborating on the access review processes. Surprise, all HR functions. <coughs> HR is an integral part of your company. So that brings us to supply chain. They work in concert with InfoSec to assess and address risk up and down the value chain. They're responsible for sourcing and providing alternative sources should an event occur, or shall I put it, when an event occurs. And they're responsible for building out and managing the effective distribution and supply system for the organization which includes redundancies, and they're integral to the disaster recovery and BIA portions of any business. So this is a major change for the core business because normally cybersecurity has been handed off. They need to do the following. They need to make sure they assess and address risk at all levels. They have to have resources for their risk management program, definitely. They need to work to mitigate these risks. So instead of saying IT handles it, they're now go their, their boards are now saying, you've got to do it, you've got to track it, you can't just say, IT, go do it anymore. Not going to happen. And you have to make good risk-based decisions and budget for maintaining and upgrading systems because you don't want to cut costs to look good. You don't want to do that because if you cut costs to meet some mythical ROI standards, you're going to see bigger costs on the back end. Why? Because if you cut the maintenance on a system, you're going to have a breach. And the breach is going to cost you 10 times more than the maintenance did in the first place. So where do you end up? You end up at a negative spot because you tried to make a quarterly profit. That's not, and that's not good. And you have to have a continual review process for each system access, which a lot of businesses really don't understand. You have to have continual risk. And that means looking at who has access to your systems. And your contracts and agreements have, need to protect the organization and its constituents. So security needs to be in a position where it's most effective. It can't be buried in IS. It can be part of IS, but don't bury it under the director of infrastructure. It needs at least a dotted line to legal and compliance. It needs to be empowered to communicate with everyone without having to ask new executive permission. This is what kills most security programs. If security is not allowed to talk to the business, it will never succeed. Board visibility, it's required. If you're not editing the board decks for a chief risk officer, you're not effective. And the CISO has to be in constant communication with the business. It is no longer an option. It's no longer a technical position. 
you are just as much a part of this as everybody else. And a large number of my peers all have MBAs now because of this. And it has to empower across the structure. So it can't just be doom and gloom. You have to empower the organization because everyone's responsible for security. And that team needs to use constant risk assessment and, and address risk to provide guidance. And people, they're aware of these issues. The responsibility of security is to make sure people know what to do. Not that the issue's out there, not to scare people, not to intimidate people. It's to empower an organization, not to intimidate it. And if you see something, you say something. That little simple thing from Department of Homeland Security, you have to be able to enable that environment and empower people, make them feel comfortable to actually say something. And you have to build rapport to do it. This is not an IT position anymore. It's a business job. It involves more aspects of human resources than people realize. Why are, what are our conclusions? What have we learned? It's a growing threat. Cybersecurity is a growing threat to businesses, and it's no longer a technology issue. It requires whole business involvement. New and disruptive technologies still need to be addressed using conventional risk assessment and, address, and addressing processes. I mean, basic blocking and tackling hasn't gone away. And I'm sorry, you can't buy a silver bullet to have good security. And continual risk assessment is the core of what the organization needs to do now. It is the core of the business now, along with whatever goods and services your business provides. And security needs to expand that role. They need to communi constantly communicate and constantly empower across the organization. And other business units need to partner with and work together to expand that role, period. You are no longer an island. You are no longer part of IT. Security, you are the business. And most important, it's no longer done in isolation. You are the business. And the reason why, these new and disruptive technologies out there, they require and encourage collaboration and community involvement. I mean, that's just it. This is where we're at. This is no longer a case of security being security. Security is the business. And with that, thank you all very, very much for your time today and I'm willing to answer any questions. You know, I like your discussion about the, the organizational changes and security becoming really comprehensive. Mm -hmm. that. In that sort of environment, how do you see the uh, decision making going around acceptable risks and when to make, when exceptions are allowed, and mm -hmm. what's sort of the organization's risk tolerance? My personal view of it is I've seen that actually go more to the legal department than with an IS. Mm -hmm. The discussions I've had over the past couple of years that has actually shifted from C-suite making that decision to C-suite deferring to the legal team to make a determination on what acceptable risk is for the organization. Luckily, lawyers are so wise in such matters. <laughs> We're in good shape. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, what I'll tell you I, what I like about the lawyers is they're very good at one thing, ferreting out where companies try and duck liability. That is the number one issue I have had on contracts for the past several years at a number of organizations I've worked at. Companies want to duck liability because they don't want to be on the hook of a breach occurs. Sure. That's your major challenge right now. So lawyers are getting a lot smarter when it comes to cybersecurity because they're treating the big issues as liability issues. And with the cloud, you're putting your data with Amazon. You're putting your data with Microsoft or with Google. And a lot, there's a lot of issues with liability. There's a lot of issues with due care. So you have to make sure you're on point. But more importantly, the vendors that you're doing business with that are doing Amazon on the back end and not telling you, you got to make sure you know where your data is going. And GDPR is going to be a big deal for that. Because mm -hmm. a lot of companies out there, give you an example. Several years ago, I had mostly client server applications I dealt with in healthcare. About a year ago, it shifted to over 50% cloud. Hmm. And this is and this is what's happening, because what's happening is vendors are realizing, we don't want to put servers on site. We'll just put our stuff on Amazon. So now it gets to the point of you have to make sure that company understands liability. You got to make sure they understand their process, as opposed to seeing some box of tin you could segment off from the rest of the world. Your stuff's in three different data centers that Amazon provides. 
and Amazon's not liable. That company's liable for configuring Amazon the right way, as Accenture so learned a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So yeah, legal is now heavily involved with the decision-making process because, quite frankly, they have to be because the risk is just too great. Just really quick, you did bring up GDPR a few times. Could you speak a little bit about how that's going to change the status quo, the, the decision-making? The reason why the European Union data, general data protection regulation is going to change is because it's going to require companies that handle people's data to know where that data is at at all times, mm -hmm. know what machines handle it, know what the processes are, know how it's protected, and know how and when to remove it if someone asks. So you're basically asking people to do everything they should have been doing already, especially if you're in healthcare, but now you're putting the full force of European Union penalties behind it. And it enforces a corporate form also with the use of the data protection officer that cannot be the same as a security officer, and usually in most cases as the privacy officer to enforce GDPR. So the European Union, I mean, it's a great initiative, is forcing companies to be more collaborative, to understand what their core business is, and to not segment off business, segment off parts of their company from each other, and continually assess and address risk, know who has access to what, under the risk of great financial penalties, and more importantly, the big black mark is going to be left if you're under a GDPR violation. So yes, it's going to change how we do business. No, thanks for that. That's excellent. Questions, comments? Yeah, yes. Sorry. So you're talking about um, the human resource aspect. Uh, what strategies with MIU Health are you using to kind of train your organization as a whole? Is it mm -hmm. large sort of get large groups together? You know, how are you financing, budgeting it, the time and money that it takes mm -hmm. to do that? Um, and the communication. Uh, I'll be very blunt. I do a guerrilla effort. I wrote all the training myself. <laughs> so, and I, the only thing we didn't write was the fishing simulator. But even then, we wrote a communication. We wrote our own communication plan around our fishing simulator of choice. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, we get out there. We talk to people. We develop training programs that are job specific. We schedule time with people. We meet with people. We talk to them. It's more important for us to meet people, understand what they're talking about, understand their needs, and put a face to the name. That's the best training program of all that we found. Mm -hmm. And it's just it's gradual. You can't do it overnight. We do awareness training. We have mandatory training from everything from PCI to HIPAA to security awareness to phishing. And while all that's great, people click through that training. And we're not going to sit there and say they don't because they do. People ignore training. They forget it. But they forget faces a lot less than they forget that PowerPoint slide they forgot about because they had to take for training three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. We want it so they know who we are as people to ask questions. We want people to be naturally curious and ask questions rather than give them some training program that they're never going to use. And we're just, we're being realistic about it. And we'd rather sit there and have the conversations with people, let the executives know who to call, let the staff know who to call, be the people out there they can, they can talk to. That's more effective than any training program you will ever have. Mm -hmm. I have time for one or, one or two more. Anybody else has ideas they want to dig in? A lot of fodder, blockchain, supply chain management, my gosh. <laughs> that this, well, I'll tell you, you know how many medical billing companies are starting to use, look at blockchain right now? It's actually, a, there's a company out there, I met their former chief scientist at TechiBank back in Cali in March, and oh, yeah, he was talking about a major, one of the 10 biggest health systems in the country, trialing blockchain for verifying verifying billing transactions. Wow. Wow. So yeah, we keep blockchain on our minds. Mm -hmm. So thank you all. Oh, I guess just one last one here. Awesome. Yeah, go right ahead. Man. Well, so with uh, supply chain and IoT, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the previous speaker we had, Mr. Microsoft, discussed building IoT devices that could be better trusted. Mm -hmm. Until that occurs, from like a business perspective, risk management, <coughs> you kind of keep IoT devices out of your facilities? Are you managing which ones you allow in? Mm -hmm. We have to manage what we allow in because there's actually, in healthcare, there's a significant regulatory issue behind it. Give you an example. Joint Commission, which pretty much regulates all, voluntarily regulates all member hospitals, has requirements on temperature monitoring. So that means pretty much 
every refrigerator you have in a hospital now that handles a controlled substance or handles something that's used for a patient has to be constantly monitored, monitored to make sure temperature is in the right place. So what you have to do is you have to borrow a little bit from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission did. So NRC with nuke plants back in the 80s and 90s developed this whole process by which, which was actually borrowed from the military, because who had nukes first? They did. Of where you have to constantly check, validate, and verify your devices. Mm. Now, that might, it's, with healthcare, it's a little bit easier to do because you have that controlled environment, but you have to have that level of control now. Because until Microsoft gets it right, or other companies get it right, there's still too much risk, unacceptable risk for organizations like mine. Well, Mitch, thank you so much again. That was really enlightening. Thank, thank you all very much.